Welcome to episode 537 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Ian Hilton, and I am a Kool-Aid. I love FC Barcelona, even though it pains me. And that's what being a football fan is all about. And yes, I sat through Barcelona's 3-2 loss against Royal Antwerp, just like you probably did. And if you have any sympathy for that, subscribing on YouTube, giving a good rating on the podcast apps, joining the Patreon, or getting something from the merch store is the way to make this kind of loss a bit easier for me to stomach. I do pride myself on being very objective on this channel, on the podcast, and I sit through a lot of criticism for not saying that the sky is falling, the manager needs to be kicked out of the club, and this player needs to be sold, that player needs to be sold. But, oh boy, after a result like today, even though Barcelona won the group, at least today I get to be objectively negative. I get to lean into the cynicism that I always fight against. Because that thing that I just watched was ugly, it was disgusting, use a bunch of other hyperbolic words about how negative it really was. So let's do it. The five headlines from Barcelona's 3-2 loss to Royal Antwerp. Headline one is Drama Lona in full effect. When I saw the starting lineup, it wasn't that the right back Hector Fort was starting, or that Lamini Mall was starting, or Ferran Torres was on the field, or Balde took his spot for Cancelo. Nothing was really surprising about the rotation in the match, other than Lewandowski up top. Because Lewandowski, Gundogan, and Araujo who wasn't even selected to the bench, those three were originally not supposed to travel. But then apparently some things happened behind the scenes, and they did. Young didn't make the trip because he fell under the weather. But why did Lewandowski start? On paper, I guess the idea was that Ferran Torres had to be the left winger because Xiao Felix was the one who really needed to be rotated. Lamine Mall and Rafinha, you'd like them both to start on the right wing, so that means the other one can't start on the left wing. I mean, against Royal Antwerp, wouldn't you rather have Rafinha on the left wing if Xiao Felix really needed that rest and rotation? But Rafinha has been a consistent starter as well, so he could have used the rest. And Lewandowski up top. Yeah, you'd love to have Ferran Torres in the middle, but I guess this was a permutation that Xavi went with. But I also think that not really. I think there was something more to this about Lewandowski really being under fire. And it's not just the English-speaking audience. I think the English-speaking audience can be reflexive at times, but then you dig deeper and you say, well, how is the Spanish media treating him? Then how is the Catalan media treating him? And Lewandowski, unlike a player like, say, a Balde, who really is only getting criticized of what I'm seeing in the English media and then some in the Spanish media, but not in the Catalan media at all. But Lewandowski is getting it from all sides at the moment. So I think there is something to Xavi admitting that Lewandowski said, hey, I'm fit and you're making me travel, so I want to play. And wanting to get some goals and wanting to get some good press for himself even. And it's frustrating because Deco was also interviewed today after Xavi was interviewed yesterday. Xavi said, the list is agreed upon with the president, Deco, and the players. Then Deco today said, we have not agreed on anything. The calls are a matter for the coach. And those two different, very different quotes are really worrying. Because it's not like questions for Lewandowski now will get any quieter after the match. And now we have questions about the relationship between Laporta and Deco and Xavi. And we'll say who's calling the shots and when. It feels like because things are going wrong and that's going to affect everything in Barcelona's bottom line, it's going to affect the way that Deco can do business with other clubs, it's going to affect sponsorship deals that Barcelona's working on. If Barcelona aren't flying high, playing well, and creating a lot of good buzz, everything on the financial side becomes a bit harder. So looking at Barcelona's history in all of the different moments, I think back to that mutiny in the late 80s with Al and Nunez, and I think about the ways that Barcelona, because there isn't just an owner that lords over all and the president can be voted out and nobody is untouchable at the club, even the legends, even like Ronald Koeman, no one is untouchable. So it does make sense over the course of the history of the club that there is that moment when the president or sporting directors and the board say, hey, we have to look out for our neck too. So we're going to take a more active role in what's happening on the field. And I do fear that that is exactly what's happening in this moment. But let me obviously it's the only time I'll talk about him in his five headlines because he was really quiet in that match. And it was a frustrating moment summed up when Lamine Yamal just delivered a perfect cross over to the penalty spot early in the game. And there was Lewandowski not making that run to the near post, but just applauding him at the edge of the box, not making the run. And that, to me, that moment kind of subbed up everything. Soon after that, Keita shouldered him off the ball. He goes to the ground like he's been in the last few weeks, and he looks like a player completely devoid of confidence. But then you hear him talk. Anybody who's known Lewandowski, the way I've watched him for 13, 14 years, from Dortmund to Bayern Munich to Barcelona, this is a player who's never been short on confidence. And this is an entirely new Lewandowski that is not one that can start at FC Barcelona, unfortunately, much longer. The other big picture is that this feels like regression. This season is way more frustrating than the last two years because this team should be better. 
the young core of Pedri, Araujo, Gabi before his injury, they were getting older, but it feels like this team has gone backwards. They still won the group, but geez, could you have tried any harder not to? Beating Porto was the point, and they wound up finishing second, but you also lost to the two teams beneath them in the table. Antwerp had lost all five of their Champions League group stage matches this season. They were the only team in the competition without a single point in the table. And this wasn't even a draw. This was a victory for the Belgian side. And Barcelona, talking about worrying form, it's now become their season. Not just a string of a few bad weeks or a few bad results sprinkled in with other things. Since those two 5 nothing wins in September, it's been 16 matches with 9 wins, all with a margin of just one goal. Then 3 draws and 4 losses. That is not a good record for FC Barcelona if they want to contend for any trophies come the spring. And it's almost shocking that not only do they win their Champions League group, but they are very much still alive in the Liga. And when I say regression, this team, that being Barcelona, did better against the teams they faced last season in the Champions League when they fell into the Europa League than this season where they did find a way to back their way into winning the group. It was an entirely different group. Barcelona were, I think on paper, in the easiest group that there was and just barely getting by isn't good enough. Headline two is Xavi's rock bottom, because our very first question is for Xavi. There are times, and even against Girona, where I put more blame on the players, which is what I did against Girona, and you've heard me in the past do that with other games too. When I said Xavi got it right, the player just didn't finish their chances, or something broke down and there were mistakes that individual players made, you look at those and say that's why Barcelona lost this game. And there were individual mistakes made, but I think Xavi didn't have it right from the start. And when I say from the start, the players also didn't have it right from the start. And I think the players and Xavi both being to blame so much today coalesced for that second minute goal. Ramirez gets the goal, Inaki Pena and Order Romeo make the mistakes. And I say mistakes, they were both at fault there. A little much on the pass from Pena and a bit of a stretch for Romeo, who didn't get enough on it, wasn't good enough of a touch, and a nightmare start for them. Ramirez getting that goal 76 seconds in means that it's the earliest scored goal against Barca in European competition since Alexander Pato's goal 23 seconds in at the Camp Nou in Milan in 2011. But that was also 2011 AC Milan, and this is 2023 for Antwerp. So a different category. Five minutes into the match, Barcelona finally calmed down and got some possession in Antwerp's half of the field. But that was short-lived instead of becoming a theme. I thought that it was just a slow start from Barcelona, but this is who they were throughout that entire match. 10 minutes in, you take stock again. It's two shots on target and a goal by Antwerp. Zero for Barcelona. Again, 10 minutes into the game. Everything was going vertical or backwards. Nothing was going forward and diagonal or horizontal in Antwerp's half of the field. The ball was moving much too slow for reasons I'll get into a bit later. At this juncture, things are Koeman final season bad. The football is just as bad as that final season under Koeman when Xavi took over in October and the players on paper are better. But unlike how Xavi was floating around in Qatar and ready to take over for Koeman, well, maybe it was a bit early, but that's a conversation that you can have with yourself and you can put that answer in the comments if you thought it was too early for Xavi. But whether it was too early for him or not, he's now had two years of top-level experience at FC Barcelona. And the team has improved on paper, at least since that time when Xavi took over. And it's not even about the result. It's about the football being played on the field. There is regression from Xavi's first season when he took over for Koeman till now. And the only thing that I'm kind of feeling guilty about and almost desiring to walk back is calling it Xavi's rock bottom is a game when you've already qualified for the group stage of the Champions League and you've already won your group. So it is kind of a meaningless game. Can you call a meaningless game a rock bottom? Well, I think I combine the drama that happened with the squad before this match It just feels like Xavi is being undermined, not even by the board, but I just feel like either the players are tuned out and the board is trusting him the least they've ever trusted him. And I think those two things above him and below him have coalesced to make it feel like Xavi's rock bottom. Now, I am not saying Xavi out. I'm still trusting in him for the rest of the season because I do honestly believe that getting rid of him before the end of this year makes no sense. There's nobody truly available to come in and replace him at this moment. And with the young players in the squad, just for their benefit, I would like to keep some continuity in Xavi with all the different debuts and, again, teenagers that he has in the squad. I would at least like to have him in charge for them for the remainder of this season. And then they can use the whole preseason and all that time away to kind of reset things and get a new voice in there. And this doesn't mean that Xavi is going to be let go. But if this is the rock bottom, then yeah, that means trophies have to come in the spring. And this all has to be turned around. 
unfortunately for Barcelona, I mean, they are seven points back in the Liga, but you still do have time. And if you're bad now, you can be a little bit better. That is the positive thing. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's getting any better on the field. It just looks since every time we say it's not getting any better, it's just getting worse. Headlines three, at least the kids did something. Let me be positive. And this is the one positive thing I'll say before the final two headlines obviously probably don't have much positivity in them. There were three teenagers plus 20-year-old Nakasado who just turned 20 and Fermi Lopez who was also just 20 playing in this match. So it was a lot of rotation. It was some young players. And Hector Fort, I think is the first name we have to say, official first team debut for him. His first touch in the game was nervy. He was closed down immediately and a dangerous cross came in. Roberto immediately came over and gave him a bit of a pick-me-up. And I'm not blaming him for the first five minutes of Barcelona kind of struggling to get any foothold in that game. But you felt like the team around him, that being even Koundé, and this is no excuse for Koundé, but I felt like they felt Fort's nerves too, and they couldn't really trust him. They didn't really want to push him forward at all. They kind of just wanted to have him receive a few passes, pass it back out of feet. But Moro Anthrop started with good pressure, with good energy at home, and they put him under a bit of pressure. Fortunately, I think he did calm down in that match. He showed you who he is. He's a stay-at-home right back who with proper chemistry with the players around him and because he and Lamine Yamal have been playing at a similar level in the youth academy for a while, I did like the fact that they seem to trust each other in a way that Fort didn't have the trust of Koundé, I would argue, until latter parts of that first half. And same thing with Roberto. It felt like he had to become accustomed to those first team players who he trains with, but obviously has never played an official match with, where Lamine Mall and he have been on the field in official matches together before. I think you can really see that in the way that they combined and understood positionally where each other were. And I think Lamine Mall even more so than Cancelo. Cancelo is obviously much more talented and experienced player than Fort. But Lamine Mall seemed to defend a bit better and be in better positions to move in tandem with Fort. And it's a reminder that chemistry, regardless of the age, seems to always matter so much more than just having a player who's more talented. And speaking of Lamine Yamal, he was certainly the biggest bright spot from this match. The 1-1, 35th minute, Antwerp had a corner and Barcelona got in transition. Ferran Torres freed Lamine Yamal, so good job by Ferran Torres on the initial pass. And then a terrific return through ball after kind of making it all happen for Torres from Lamine Yamal. And Torres finishes. The pass got through five red and white shirts perfectly waited for Torres to take one touch to set himself up and finish. Lamine Mall did all the heavy lifting on this goal. And while he did not get the goal himself later when he hit the post, it was still an important moment for Lamine Yamal to pull those strings, get Ferran Torres in, and good running by Ferran Torres, who is the only of the attackers who's going to make that run into the box in that way. So good on Ferran Torres, but better from Lamine Mall in this game. In the 76th minute, Marc Casado came on for Roberto, It may not have been worse if he had started, to be honest. I'll be talking about Sergio Roberto in a minute, of course, with very few good things to say for Barcelona's first captain. But I thought Marc Casado was pretty bright. Instead of being nervous, it did help that Antwerp were on the back foot. So Casado got to see more of the ball. But I did think that he was moving well, running well. And for a team and an offense that looks so, so stagnant, just having somebody willing to run with the ball, who also has the understanding on when to step in and make some interceptions brought some energy that I think Barcelona needed. Will he get more minutes? I'm not sure. Again, the verdict on Casado for me, I know he's still 20, but I think I know what he's going to be. I think there's a certain level to him. But at this point in the season with the level that Barcelona's playing at, I think Casado is at least at the level that Barcelona's at at the moment. So there might be a few more minutes coming up for him, if not for the winter break. It might even be a bit of bad timing, but with Copa del Rey on the horizon, I think we will see Marc Casado again in the coming weeks. And of course, Mark Yu got the goal, and I'm going to talk about that as we go through that final bit of the match. But yeah, two goals for him in three appearances for the first team. Awesome. 17 years old, couldn't ask much more. A 17-year-old for Barcelona scoring two goals already, it already puts you in the history books. It already makes you monumental for scoring that kind of number. So good on you, Mark Yu. Headline four is what happened to them. Let's go in the opposite direction because there are players that when you talk about minutes, Xavi already wasn't trusting. And when you rotate players that you haven't really been trusting and haven't been in your starting 11s that he did not change for three straight matches, it means that when you fall on your face like this, how can Xavi trust you even more? Ori Romeo was, I don't mean to use the word terrible because when you're a defensive midfielder and the structure of the team completely is broken around you, you wind up being exposed with your worst qualities. But he did not do anything to help himself either. 
the ball was not moving fast enough. And we go back to last season with Sergio Busquets. His best games were when Barcelona were moving the ball well, side to side, and everybody seemed to be clicking. One touch passing was going on. And with Busquets, the arguments was always about in transition, breaking down those counters, what was happening to him. And I thought he also, that being Busquets, he had a lack of comma, a lack of pausa in the latter parts of last season. And there were moments, especially in Europe, where it did feel like he had slowed down a bit in the way that he moved the ball, that being Sergio Busquets. But that, again, is leagues faster with what Oro Mayu does. It's two touch every time instead of one touch, which is not what I saw from Romeo last season at Girona and not the player I was excited to see for FC Barcelona. And I think structurally, immediately, the response is that Alex Garcia was always closer to him than Roberto or Firmin Lopez were today. Firmin Lopez was a high interior, which is not what Girona was employing last season. And Alex Garcia is more the Frankie de Young mold, where he begins a little bit deeper. He can pass at a high level. At least, again, this is Alex Garcia last season, and he's done even more of it this season from a deeper position, defending a bit better. Again, we're talking about Alex Garcia here, but Alex Garcia is just better on the ball and playing with so much more confidence than Roberto does. So it seems like every time you go from Roberto to Romeo, and fine with one touch passes. I mean, I think I can count that on one hand. Not to pile on Romeo, we already talked about him and the first goal, but the second one then comes. 56 minute, and this is gross. It's just a giveaway. Took too much time on the ball and just sloppy. Janssen with the finish because Kunde wasn't tight enough, and you can say Kunde's name, but that's all on Romeo. Yusuf had too much time to pick out the pass because he was able to go straight downhill, taking the ball right off of the feet of Romeo. And Sergio Roberto, now speaking about him, he was running around like he wanted to do something in the first half, but he didn't do much of anything. Right after Luminium would hit the post, Barcelona on the verge of a second. Less than 30 seconds later, Sergio Roberto got the red card on a mess of a tackle. Fortunately, the ref changes it to a yellow. Probably fair to be a harsh yellow and not a red, but that's how Roberto felt. He just was late to everything today, late to the 50-50s, late to the second balls. Didn't feel like he was winning his error duels. Again, I felt like after this match, I'm not even looking up the numbers. I'm just telling you what I feel like I saw. And it just felt like he wasn't winning the duels he needed to. Again, even if the stats say it, he wasn't in the right positions to even make the quality duels he needed to to put Barcelona back on the front foot. And then Balde was a mess, especially in that first half. No connection with Ferran Torres whatsoever. And Sergio Roberto had started on the right and Fermin Lopez on the left. And I think that's how Xavi wanted to see his team with Fermin Lopez getting high and kind of keeping Balde at home a little bit more to give more support to that back line where Hector Fort is going to have Balde on the left as well and kind of keep a flat back four and trust your front six to have more possession against Roar Antwerp, who should have been on the back foot. But that meant that Balde, once they went down one nothing, had to get forward a bit more. So that's why Roberto, I think, was moved over to the left to support Balde a bit more. And even the players, it does feel like, I know Balde was from the academy, and actually Roberto was too, and technically Romeo, but of course he was signed. But it feels like a lot of what we saw with Manchester United, and I know they're catching a stray here, but Manchester United, those signings over the last few seasons have felt like players that were signed for what they were at their last club, but arrived to be lesser versions of themselves. And that is what I see in Oro Romeo. This is not the player that I saw for Girona. I vouched for that player last year, and this is not that player. He's devoid of confidence. He's taking too many touches. He's on the ball too much. Defensively, he's struggling in the air, and I, yeah, I don't know what to say. Kunde, he was really lucky for Barca that Janssen was offside earlier in that second half, or things could have got worse for Barcelona early. The let fed Ramirez at the back post, and while it was the right call, Janssen was just beyond Kunde. It was another thing of worry. And there were so many little moments on the goals that I already mentioned and I'll mention with the third goal. It seems like a lack of concentration from Kunde. The space even that Vermeeren ran into was gigantic. Roberto was totally out of position, but Christensen and Kunde, were they communicating? I, I know they had Balde and Fort, but I was just concerned about the way that there seems to be no structure along that back line. And even when there are acres of space in the midfield, there doesn't seem to be any trust within everybody in the squad. And that's a shabby thing. Seems like players just aren't bought in. And that's Kunde certainly at the moment, not knowing if he's a right back or a center back from game to game. And that is why I brought up to Domagoy, not to be all conspiracy Dan here, but if there's one player on that back line who might not be in the club next season, I'm calling it now. It might be Kunde. I know he's arguably next to Araujo, the highest ceiling player, the most talented player on paper. But if there's no natural position for him and he's unhappy and his level is dropping because of his unhappiness and they can't get that sorted, again, 60 or 70 million, 
and you know you need a defensive midfielder, that might be a trade that Barcelona have to make this offseason. And then headline five, desperate for an equalizer against Antwerp. Desperate for an equalizer against Antwerp pretty much sums up the state of Barcelona this week. That game got even messier in the second half, which does support an Antwerp win. 60th minute, Gundogan on for Romeo, and it had to happen. Cancelo on for Fort, which is a bit unfair to the 17-year-old, but again, it had to happen, I get it. And then Pedri on for Fermin Lopez. Immediately, Gundogan plays a better diagonal ball to get out of pressure. That showed you he is an upgrade from Romeo, duh. But then he was dispossessed in the 65th minute, allowing a long shot to Antwerp, making it feel like, well, I don't think anybody can save this match. Pedri had an opportunity, though. Good layoff from Lewandowski into Pedri's path, but he gets closed down before he can get a shot off. And that was the story of the second half of Barcelona as far as getting shots from open play. 20 minutes left. I always take stock on how much I believe in Barcelona when they're trailing. But today was such a weird check-in because I was like, yeah, of course, with the players on the field, I believe that they can come back in this match. But I also thought the way they had played, I don't think you can dig yourself out of that hole. Well, yeah, I wound up being right. 72nd minute, Mark Yu in for Lewandowski, and Gui had played for the U19s on the weekend, scored a brace, so in pretty fine form, also coming off the World Cup, the U17s, so Mark Gui has been in fine form this season at any level, the U19s, Barca Athletic with the first team, had already scored a goal, so in good form, good moment for him, putting more Antwerp under much pressure, but obviously Antwerp were sitting in with a lead and Barca weren't getting any shots off, so it doesn't matter how much pressure Barca were putting them under if you're not even getting it on net. It was quite a bit of cross and pray with a ton of Antwerp blocks coming late. Casado did well, as I mentioned, but I don't have much else to talk about positive other than Balde was better when Barca had more possession and was playing farther upfield, which again, makes sense. I don't know how much we can extrapolate from that. 2-2 came, free kick off the foot of Gundogan. Mark Yu getting on the end of it with the header. He stays on side. Nobody put a body on him as he made the run in front of Christensen. So two first team goals and really simple goals too. Those are things that you can replicate as a young player. To get in the mixer, make a good run, and get that header on goal. Good technique from him. And again, to do it at 17, just so young, awesome stuff. But then the 3-2. No moment to celebrate for Mark Yu. Because what in the living heck here? Elena Kenna scores the winner just moments later. The ball ricochets off the Antwerp midfielder from Casado's tackle. So a bit unfortunate. But then perfectly a one-touch pass that you didn't see from Barcelona seemingly all night perfectly playing in the run of Ilya Kenna in behind. What is going on with Jules Koundé? I'll say that again, because now Barcelona have lost four times in their last nine games, which is just unacceptable. That's it. I think I said all the negative parts of it. This went a bit long even for all that negativity, but that's what frustration and criticism leads you to. When you have such, what I would say is a watershed moment, and you want to ask Barcelona after Girona, where was your response? Well, this was a meaningless game. Valencia does matter. It should matter. After we're Antwerp, now this became a game with meaning because of how bad it was. So now that Valencia game has double the meaning. It matters because you're seven points back in the Liga. It matters because you're playing like utter garbage. So I do want to see a response from the first team. I'll leave you with a little more bad news here at the end, unfortunately. Watching the Femini, Mappy Leon potentially out for the season after surgery on a meniscus. FC Barcelona's Femini team is still terrific. They're still one of the best teams in the world. But if they lose her for the season, that being Mappy Leon, that is a huge loss. She is so vital to the way that they play. And for me, the best ball playing center back in world football. She unlocks so many dynamics. She's tremendous from set piece opportunities, whether receiving or delivering. Mappy Leon is a gigantic, gigantic loss for the Barca Femini this season if she's unable to come back after this surgery. But like we saw with Alexia Pateas, Barcelona's Femini have found ways. They have depth. They are a much more inspiring team than Barcelona's men's team in the first team level, at least. So there it is. That's all the bad news I have for you. Again, you can help me out and give me some positive this holiday season. That'd be nice. But we're already going to be talking about Valencia in a few short days. No other podcast this week. I've been under a bit of pressure with other stuff. So until next time, as always, Forza Barca. Barca.